So let's talk about the world of pathology. Before bringing the world of pathology, or what is pathology? Pathology is the backbone of medicine. Uh, well, if I remove your backbone, what happens to your body? You can't stand, that is impossible. You can't even sit, you can't even lie down. So pathology is the only difference between a good and a bad physician. No matter what you want to become in life, whatever care is speciality or subspeciality you want to specialize in medicine, if you do not know your pathology, you will not be there. Pathology is all about diagnosis. The correct conclusive diagnosis comes only from pathology. It's the most logical branch of medicine. In my very personal opinion, the only good doctor will know pathology. And the only pathology doctor will be good. So what is pathology? Well, pathology, before going on to pathology, the father of modern pathology was known as one Ludwig Rudolf Virchow, and he told around 500 years back to the world that whatever disease process is there in this world begins at the level of the cell. So that gave birth to what is called as cellular pathology. Okay. So let's break it. Most of the medicine has been written in Greek and Latin, and where does it come from? It comes from Alexander the Great, who nearly captured 70% of the world many centuries back, and if you no, Greece was the originator of medicine, including pathology. So all pathology, literally every medicine word comes from Greek and Latin words because Alexander went here, there, everywhere. And so his language was Greek and Latin. So it's all spread that way. So please remember, if you remember the root words, which I'll keep on rattling out as I go through this ocean of pathology, you'll understand it. So let's break the pathology word into two. In Greek language, pathos means suffering and logos means study. So it basically means study of suffering, study of suffering. You can have human pathology, you can have animal pathology, you can have plant pathology, you can have algae pathology. You can have many people, so many doing so many types of pathology. But in medicine, we are concentrating on study of human suffering. Well, it involves the study of disease processes and the structural and functional changes in the cells, tissues, organs, or the entire organs, organism that cause or are caused by the disease. Well, if you ask me what are we or what is a human being made up of, it is all about conglomeration of specialized cells doing specialized functions, and that is we. So we are nothing but a conglomeration, a collection of specialized cells. See with the nose? No. Can we see with the, can we smell with the, eyes no so we are all specialized well I was, as i was telling you pathology explains and house of all the signs and symptoms manifested by the patient now why is the patient called as a patient because as a physician he is sick person you should understand and you have to be patient with him well the most important thing in medicine is you have to ask why this happened to this patient how this happened to the patient all these answers are coming from pathology the only difference between a good and a bad physician is the knowledge of pathology. So let's do what is called as a disease. We keep on saying, I'll cure disease, I'll become a big doc one day and I'll do this and do... What is dis-ease? Well, it is a dis-ease, a person who is not at ease with himself. That is disease. Well, most of the diseases, we know the cause and some of the diseases, we still do not know the cause. So the diseases which we do not know the cause of, is called as idiopathic. That's another medical word parlance you have to learn that certain diseases are there in the world, but till date in today's era also, we do not know the cause and that is what is called as idiopathic cause of the disease. Injury is a stimulus which damages us. A lesion is any abnormality in the body which results in impairment or total loss of function. Now let's begin the four aspects of the disease process. Certain terms are there which will be repeated throughout the process of pathology learning and teaching. So we have to go through the ABCs of pathology. Terminologies have to be learned the correct way. What is causing the disease? Smoking causes lung cancer. So that is the cause of lung cancer. What we call in pathology as a cause is etiology. Etiology basically refers to this thing causes that disease. So that is the cause of the disease. Well, the mechanism of its development, let's go back to very simple biology concepts. Okay. Anopheles mosquito, the female Anopheles mosquito has a plasmodium. This plasmodium is there inside the female Anopheles mosquito. 
This bites you on the skin and you get malaria. The word mal area. Mal means bad. Area means air. All this is Greek, guys. So mal area. Very ancient. We have learned from the ancient literature of medicine, malaria. So mal area. People just knew that you are in an unhygienic kind of a environment where the air is not good. Obviously, they didn't know it is caused by the mosquito. They didn't know what is plasmodium centuries and centuries back but they knew this thing that anybody who's meant gets this kind of a disease so they called it mal area okay now if the mosquito bites you right at this moment it is around 11 10 a.m for me in caribbeans in aruba do you get malaria at 11 11 no so the story of the development of a disease from the cause to the manifestations of sign and symptoms the malaria will be caused around 24 to 48 hours after the mosquito bite. So this is the mechanism of its development from the cause. The mosquito bit me at 11.10 and it took me around 24 to 48 hours before I started developing some signs and symptoms. This is what is called as pathogenesis. The mechanism, the story of the development of the process of the disease. Well, now, as I was saying, the one Ludwig Rudolf Farkau, the father of modern our cellular pathology, who revolutionized the way of thinking as medicine we see today, is that everything starts at the level of the cell before he said that. So, it is very ironically and very funnily mentioned in the books of literature of medicine that you are a sinner, that's why you got a disease. You are a cheat, that's why you getting a disease today. It's nothing like that. There is a cause and there is a effect. It is what is called as cause effect in pathology. So the etiology is there, which is the etiology. It is a plasmodium coming from the stomach of the female and of fleas mosquito. And 24 to 48 hours after the mosquito has bit you, the pathogenesis has taken place. There are structural changes which are induced in the cells and of the body these are what is called as morphological changes so everything what happens at a organism level at the human level has occurred already in the cells cell is sick you are sick so morpho morpho means body basically morph means body in greek so morphological changes take place in the cell and when there are morphological changes in a cell there are functional changes in the cell a cell who is not morphologically normal will also be functionally not normal. So morphological changes lead to functional abnormal changes. Whatever is happening is happening at the level of the cell. Well, if the cell is not, is not happy, it is sick, it is ill, then you will have some clinical manifestations. So the functional consequences of the morphological changes result into what we call as clinical signs and symptoms. So as I told you before, let's repeat it again. Etiology is the cause of a disease. The cause of a disease. Alcohol causes liver cancer. Smoking causes lung cancer. Mosquito bite, female anopheles causes malaria. So that is the cause. Now these are acquired causes. Okay, infections are the most common etiological factors in the western part of the world no in the eastern part of the world just for the sheer reason because eastern part of the world is poor whereas the western part of the world is rich rich look at america look at canada look at australia look everywhere except the asia and africa most of the people out there are living a very luxurious life in my very personal opinion i call them luxurious diseases smoking like a chimney drinking like a Camel eating like a glutton, life is happy, not exercising, too much of stress is there, all you want is money, 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 no money, no honey, type of personality. So you get what you call as nutritional imbalances diseases. Too much of nutrition is going inside you and bad kind of nutrition is going inside you. You get myocarditis, which is the number one killer in the western part of the world. You get cancers. Cancer is all about human greed. It is increasing. So these are the different types of acquired etiologies okay chemical let's talk about the chemical etiology chemical etiology accidentally you put hydrochloric acid while working in the chemistry lab thinking it to be water and you get poisoned okay you are wanting to commit a suicide and you take cyanide that's a chemical going inside you and you can die of it physical you are going on a motorcycle and you get a fracture 
matter that is physical so all these are the examples of acquired etiology whereas the other major class of etiology is inherited inherited basically means it is a genetic defect it is a defect in the dna deoxyribonucleic acid is the genetic material current through the generations okay so please remember what is a mutation a permanent change in the dna an irreversible change in the dna it can lead to various types of cancers and it can lead to various kinds of syndromes like down syndrome and so many out there so this is not my mistake it runs in my family i have inherited it from my ancestors let's talk about the second thing the story the sequence of events the story that leads to development of a disease the story from etiology to symptoms and signs the structural alterations caused by a disease is what is called as a morphological change now if i say that there is a change at the level of the cell there must be a change at the level of gross now gross means basically what i see with my gross naked eye normal human eye i can see from outside the liver is not looking normal i'm not using my microscope i'm not going at the cellular level i'm just seeing it with my gross naked eye and that's why it is macroscopic change macro means huge big so macroscopic change appreciated by simple human naked eye now if i take a section from there what we call as a biopsy then it is called as a microscopic change i put my my arm eye is the microscope and i see change in the cell there is another term which you need to give you a very simple example late australia sitting here i will say oh my god you saw mycobacterium tuberculosis section of the lung you saw pulmonary tuberculosis finished you saw this you saw that and it is this it can be a pathognomonic symptom a pathognomonic sign it can be a pathognomonic gross finding it can be a pathognomonic histologic or microscopic finding you say this is this seen i have seen this thing there is only one diagnosis in the whole wide world that is what is meant by pathognomonic so we have been talking about like last thing is that anything which is starting as a disease process the patient comes to you in the office for a reason he is not a very happy chap he is in your office begging for your help as a doctor when he comes in remember and whatever he says in his native language he doesn't know medical language he doesn't have any idea of what is medical terminology whatever he says i have pain i have dizziness i have headache whatever he says in his language is a symptom that is patient subjective observations which get him to your office office test i have got this thing i have got this problem i have got that thing that is sign is what you discover in your patient by history taking by physical examination by laboratory investigations and by radiological investigation says i have got pain in my stomach doctor i have got pain in my stomach that's all i can say okay is a layman now when you do the history taking and when you touch his liver by the the example you find his liver is enlarged that is a sign you have discovered in his body you find there is temperature raised in his body maybe he doesn't know he doesn't know feverish but you tell johnny you have got a fever of 101 degree fahrenheit whatever you discover is a sign whatever he tells you in his language is a symptom so you might be aware of this thing and then there is something called as prognosis prognosis means the most likely expected outcome from a particular disease doctor you told malaria will i die no you will not die i've got anti malarials which will be very effective you will be absolutely treated within a week or so you will be running back to your office you will be happy doctor i have been told by you, you i have got aids acquired immunodeficiency what will be the final outcome johnny There's no cure for AIDS. Final outcome: not die today, but downstairs, lying twenty years. Doctor, I have got liver cancer. How many months for me? Doctor says six months to one year. So good prognosis means just recovery is very highly likely. And poor prognosis means either you are going to die or you are going to be morbid. Now there is morbidity and mortality. So on the word mortal, 
only the almighty god is immortal he never dies he never came he is always there he is there. but we as human beings or any organism who is living on this earth walking around will die one day that is for sure so the word mortality means you are going to die the word morbidity means that you will not have a very good life but you will still survive you will have a very bad qol quality of life you have been diagnosed with bronchial asthma okay you will not die of it as of now you will live with it but a poor quality of life you'll get attacks of bronchial asthma from time to time and that's okay so that is what is called as morbidity quality of life is not good as you expected it to be because there is a disease process in you which is impairing your activities of daily living what is called in medicine or pathology as adl activities of daily living means i get up in the morning i brush my teeth i bathe i go i eat breakfast i live my life good that will be compromised another term what you have to learn in pathology is complication you already have one disease and then you get a second disease occurring during the course of a primary or the first disease for example you have already got a coronary artery which supplies the heart there are three of them we are not going into details one of them has got atherosclerosis pattern and what is atherosclerosis deposition of excessive cholesterol primarily the oxidized low density lipoprotein in the intimal layer of your coronary artery too much for you you just try to understand there is already a pathology already a disease in your coronary artery which is impairing your life you already suffer from it and one day one fine day i should not say one very bad day you get a myocardial infarction you get a heart attack what is called as myocardial infarction so myocardial infarction occurred during the course of the atherosclerotic coronary artery disease so this is well normality trauma as in the case of suicide or somebody wanted to kill you leading direct to death there are only five ways you can die natural you have lived your good life you are 80 90 year old man and you just old machine how much we are at the end of the day cells as i was still every machine you buy a bmw 7 series but it will die one day maybe 30 years on the line on the line naturally it has died accident you die in an accident there are so many accidents occurring in fact the most common cause of death in the children worldwide is accidents you should remember this the most common cause of death in the children category worldwide suicide you commit suicide you're not happy with life for some reason homicide homicide means basically just the opposite of our suicide suicide is voluntarily done by a person in his body whereas homicide in very simple terms at this level i will equate it to murder somebody murdered you and undetermined i do not have a reason or a cause or anything to justify how did you die and there are 20% of deaths in this world today also where and no physician no autopsy expert will be able to tell how this chap died so that is what is called as undetermined diagnosis well the only difference between a good and a bad physician is the diagnosis there is something called as what is we call as differential diagnosis see the last one a list of possible diagnoses well i have fever and cough and difficulty in breathing there can be 101 diseases in this world which can cause fever cough and difficulty in breathing the only doctor who will be successful is who will bring down from 101 to the correct conclusive one diagnosis it is all about differential diagnosis dd to one faster you can get it the cheaper you can get it using the less of money of the patient using less resources of the lab resources of the radiological services and using the less of the medicines you, you should understand the best doctor in the world uses less of everything and still is able to cure so that is the most successful doctor if you are putting so many lab investigations if you are ordering patients if you are giving 10 types of antibiotics you do not know your job something will work somewhere that is the case patients understand this very well gone are those days when the patients were ignorant so pathology has to be learned carefully and very sincerely 
if you do not know your pathology, whether you are a plastic surgeon or a neurosurgeon or whatever you want to become in life, if your pathology is weak, sadly speaking, ironically speaking, you'll never be successful. It is all about coming from 101 DDs to 1 DD as soon as possible, as cheaply as possible, as reasonably as possible. Then only you will be successful. Because I was going through one of the articles around three months back. It said that the best of the doctors in New York, and they did this on around 30,000 doctors questionnaire, live questionnaire interview. It's a retro retrospective study. And these are big stalwarts who have retired. All of them were retired. That was one of the criteria. And they asked these all doctors who had minimum of 50 years of practice in the Big Apple, New York. A question was very simple. How many drugs do you use or have you used in your entire 50 years of practice? And they said 70 to 80. 70 to 80 drugs, even a taxi driver can mug up. You can just memorize and you can. But where to use it, how to use it, diagnosis is the most important. They ask the surgeon, how many surgeries have you done throughout your 50 years of career to be roaming in helicopters and to be making mansions and going around here, there, name, fame, fortune, you have everything. They said four to five surgeries I kept on doing throughout my life. When to do it is the big question in the surgeon's life. When not to do it is the biggest question in the surgeon's life. So correct diagnosis, correct decision, correct opinion, this all will be backed up by solid, sound knowledge of pathology. You cannot escape it. As far as US Emily is concerned, it is one of the most logical exams and you cannot fluke it. You know, it is exam, it is one of the most well-researched exams in as far as medical science is concerned. And ironically, again, because in the step one, they ask you basic sciences, pathology is nearly 40 to 50% of step one. So you cannot play around with pathology. You have to know it. The other thing I always say about there's no bigger ocean in the world than pathology. If you pick up Harrison, the Bible of medicine, it is 85% pathology, guys. Only 15% is, as I was telling you, treatment is a cakewalk. The problem is that people do not come from their differential diagnosis to diagnosis. So what they do is 101 differential diagnosis, they will boil down to 10 diagnosis, 10 differential diagnosis, and they will give 20 medicines for that, not knowing what is the correct conclusive diagnosis. If you know your pathology, you will come from 101 to 1. It's all about diagnosis. Medicine is all about diagnosis. Treatment is a cakewalk. Only 15% of Harrison is treatment. Last two, three lines, they tell you this surgery, that medicine. Before that, it is all pathology. So let's talk about the classification of the pathology subject, which is the largest subject of medicine, by the way, in terms of volume. Never, because you cannot drink the whole ocean. You cannot. Don't try to mug up pathology illogically. It is not worth it. It is useless. Even if you become a doctor, it is the application part of medicine. Doctor will be entertained by the patient only if the patient gets cured. Theoretical knowledge of pathology or for that matter medicine doesn't work. You have to cure the patient. So you have to know it logically. You have to know the concepts, the deep complex concepts of pathology are the laying foundations of medicine. So let's talk about some classifications of pathology. General pathology is the study of general reactions of cells and issues to insults and injuries that are basic to all of them. Basically, it is fundamental concept. Basically, it is the laying down of the foundation. You can make a Taj Mahal, but if you have a very weak foundation, it will last maybe for one or two years. The Taj Mahal in India is lasting for so many years because they have done great research about it that the emperor Shah Jah spent around three years making the foundation only and people in that country at that point got fed up. When are you going to actually start the Taj Mahal, he said, no, 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 the foundation is far more important than the building itself. So the foundational concepts of pathology, if you don't understand, you understand what is called as systemic pathology. Systemic pathology basically refers to study of the organ systems. Let me name some cardiovascular system. That means cardio, cardio word comes from cardia, cardia words comes from cordial. I've got cordial relationship. Cordial means I've got relationships related to my heart. I'm very cordial to my professor. I'm very cordial to my parents. I'm very uh, cordial to my colleagues. Cordial, cardia, 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 all heart. Vascular vessels. 
So it is all about the heart and the vessels of the body. Respiratory system, that is lung. Hairy system, that is the liver and the gallbladder. And so on and so forth. The musculoskeletal system, the muscles and the skeleton, the bones. The reproductive system, female reproductive system, that is male reproductive system. So these are these systems. So when I build up the concepts of general pathology, that is the foundation I have laid down, then I will go deep into the organ system specifically. I'll pick up one organ system and I'll tell you about that. Now, this is all about application of pathology or application of medicine. You can have anatomic pathology being done in a cadaver. Now, what is a cadaver? Cadaver means a dead body. Man is dead. I'm opening up. In my career, I've done more than 35,000 autopsies. We call it also autopsy. Autopsy, necropsy basically means I'm opening up a cadaver, which is called as a dead body. So that is what is called as necropsy pathology. Surgical pathology is very simple to understand. Somebody is being opened up when he or she is alive to get a diagnosis. Cytopathology basically means cyto. Cyto comes from the Greek word cyte. Cyte means cell. Cell. We are all nothing but a conglomeration of cells. So I put a needle inside your any organ. I can puncture and take cells from every organ of your body except one. And that is eye. If I put a needle in your eye, you know, you'll go blind. But other than the eye, I can put a fine needle inside your any organ and suck out some cells, aspirate some cells, put them on a glass microscopy slide and stain them. And that is what is called of cells, the cytopathology. Clinical pathology is all about the study of the specimens. What kind of specimens? All sorts of liquid specimens. Liquid specimens, the various specimens like blood, blood is liquid, serum, plasma, urine, feces, spinal fluid, sputum, so many things are there which I can just or semi solidish, and most of them are liquidish kind of specimen which I can take from the body. And why do I take to get a diagnosis or to direct a therapeutic approach or to monitor a treatment? And there is something called as forensic pathology. It's very interesting. Oh, this man died by suspicious circumstances. How did he die? I don't know. Who will tell? The forensic pathologist will tell. All sorts of suicides, murders, all those rape cases, they undergo the forensic pathological examination to know the cause of death. Nobody knows. So they do it, they tell the world. This was it. We have another term which is called as biopsy. Bio means life. PSY means look. Look at life. That is exactly bio. PSY is a Greek word. Look at life. So basically, it is examination of the tissues from the living body. So please remember, biopsy is a living body thing. Autopsy is a dead body thing. So I cannot say I have taken a biopsy from a cadaver. No. C has to be taken from a live patient. Why I'm taking a chip out of your body to make a correct conclusive diagnosis. Who takes a biopsy? The pathologist takes a biopsy. Let me tell you one more thing. I might be sounding slightly arrogant at that time. Bear with me. The final diagnosis always comes from the pathology. You as a physician or a surgeon will have what is called as clinical suspicion or clinical acumen. You will say, Dr. Saxena, I'm a very big neurosurgeon. I agree. But you will always put a question mark, question mark. Is this this? Is this this? I will, as an adjunct to your expertise of a neurosurgeon, tell you this is this. Carry a job. Good job. Now, when I say it, that means pathology is the backbone of medicine. No matter what kind of a physician or surgeon you are, you have to depend upon the pathologist's opinion, especially in today's era. So you can have two, three types of biopsies. Close biopsy means the pathologist or even some physicians do it. Put the needle into the mask to obtain a bit of tissue. I'll show you some pictures, you know. Open biopsy basically means made an incision. I've not put a needle. You understand? Putting a needle is different from making an incision. Why I made an incision? Because the mass inside, the pathology inside was so huge, I had to take it all out. I cannot take it with the help of a needle. If a needle is used, I just set some little tissue and that is closed. I have made a huge incision and I have opened it up and I have taken out the whole mass. Excisional biopsy is what is called a surgery. I call it excisional biopsy. Surgeons call it 
surgical removal, surgical excision. Means you have breast cancer, Rita. I am very, very sad to declare this to you, but I have to take out your left breast since it is cancerous. So I removed the whole breast, what we call as mastectomy. A surgeon will say, I have removed the breast. I have performed the surgical excision, removal of breast. For me, that removal of breast as a pathologist, I call it excisional biopsy. The whole breast is in my hand. So that is what is called excision. I have exercised. So some pictures, we have got different types of needles to do the closed biopsy. It is also called as core biopsy because if you see here, the cores, these are the cylindrical cores which are coming out from here. Well, the closed or core biopsy can be done. Biopsy can be done for any organ as I was telling you, except the eye for the same plain simple reason that you will go blind. So now breast and thyroid because they are so approachable they are so exterior in the human body i do it blindly okay i do not need the radiological help but for deep masses in organs like liver spleen pancreas they're deep there i cannot go blindly why because i can puncture some of the other vital organs around the organ which i want to biopsy so i go under the radiological guidance of a radiologist. My friend radiologist will be guiding me with the probe as you're seeing over here and this is me with my needle going inside his probe guidance. It can be ultrasonography guidance, it can be CT guidance, it can be MRI guidance, it can be PET. Can you guess what organ is this? This is the breast and this is the whole breast has been removed for a cancer. Okay, So that is excisional biopsy. This is what I was telling you, fine needle aspiration cytology, F and A, C, a thin bore needle, very, very thin. We use something called as gauze 20 or 22. I can do mostly, it is done for the superficial masses in the breast and thyroid, but I can do any kind of fine needle aspiration cytology for any deep mass lesions under the help of CT scan, computerized tomography scan, ultrasonography or MRI or PET scan or whatever. Advantage is over biopsy is what? Quick, I just need a needle. That's all. It can be done without anesthesia, except for deeper masses where the local anesthesia is given. It is cheaper. Biopsy has to be done in a minor operation theater. Whereas the FNAC can be in a simple, plain clinic of mine. I just need a place for the patient to sit or lie down. Does not require any admission. Biopsy many a times requires overnight admission. No money, no honey. People are poor. So I will just do a back, just do FNAC and avoid a biopsy. Report can be given by a clever pathologist within a couple of hours. Whereas biopsy, I have taken out a tissue as I was showing you those cylindrical cores. They have to undergo a process of what is called as tissue processing by the tissue microprocessor. And that takes around 48 hours. So 48 hours is too long a time. Biopsy is a cumbersome procedure. FNAC is a simpler one. So let's see some pictures. This is a biopsy being done of the breast. 90% of the world is right-handed, including me. So what we do is with the left hand, we fix the lump. There's a lump in the breast. There's a swelling mass in the breast. And with the left hand, I fix it. Why do I fix it? Because it will move. If I put the needle and if it moves, then the purpose is lost. So I fix the lump with my left hand being a right-hander. And then I put the needle inside, as you can see here. And as I'm sucking out what? I'm sucking out cells. It is a cytology. These are the breast cancer cells out here. These are the breast cancer cells. These are so grotesque, so frightening, abusing, howling, shouting. Nobody is happy with nobody. They are all different from each other. This is what is called as pleomorphism. Pleo in Greek means different. Morph means body. Different size and different shapes of cells. Different size and different shape of nucleus of cells. Some of them are really very dark. See this one so dark. Very angry looking cell. What has happened to this? This is all cancer cells. If I can say so with very confidence and conviction level, this is a normal breast cell. Compare this one with this one. My God, this is bad. This is really, really, very, very, very high grade breast cancer. Now coming to what is called as frozen section. Try and imagine there are two rooms. Room is the operation theater and the right side room is the lab, the frozen pathology lab. Okay. And there is a window between these two rooms. The surgeon is doing a patient. He is operating live right now as I am speaking. He is doing there. I am speaking live to you. He is operating live right, right there. There is a small window between these two 
rooms. One is OT, Operation 30, and the other one is my lab, where I am doing the frozen sections. He takes a chip of tissue from there, and he opens that window, obviously. The assistant opens, and he says, you know, the surgeon has given this chip to you. Just see what is the diagnosis. I say it is cancer, and he removes the whole organ. If I say no cancer, he closes the body, and he comes out. So why is it tissue being frozen? It is being frozen to get a rapid diagnosis while the patient is still on the operating table. The abdomen is open. The piece of tissue to be studied is snap frozen. Why? Because the freezing makes the tissue solid enough to get it cut. You see, when I get a tissue, I have to make a microscopic slide out of it. So I want a very, very thin part of the tissue, what you call as thin section of the tissue. Why so cut it with a microtome? Microtome is something like a knife your mother uses in the kitchen. So microtome is my knife. The pathologist's knife is called microtome. So I cut it with the microtome. It's a machine kind of a thing. And I frozen sections are performed with an instrument called a cryostat. Cryostat is something like a size of five-star hotel if you've gone sometimes. It's a small fridge size thing. Small fridge, you know, with the smallest ones. So it's just a refrigerated box containing my pathologist. So I freeze it. I make it solid. Solid things are easier cut and try and imagine the consistency of the organs in the human body are something like butter you know butter so butter is not that solid okay but i want not solid so that i get clean straight sections so i cut it and then i put them on the glass slide i stain them and i give a rapid diagnosis how rapid do i give a diagnosis within two to three minutes within two to three minutes the diagnosis has to be given Try and imagine, guys, if you do not know your pathology, life is a stake. You cannot be mistaken. One mistake will be taken for a very long ride. So pathology is really very important. So some examples out here. At times during the surgery, it is necessary to get a very rapid diagnosis of pathologic process. That's where the frozen... The surgeon may want to know if the margins of his resection for a cancer are clear or not. Try and imagine. Let's say the cancer size or the cancer mass size the cancer mass size is two centimeter in radius now is it good enough to just take out that two centimeter mass and call it a day no we do know that even if one cancer cell is left the story will start again it's a the surgeon doesn't have a microscopic eye he has a blind eye what we say as a normal human naked eye so what we tell the surgeons and surgeons are trained like that and that's the reason that they are aggressive in nature if there is a two centimeter cancer tissue take out four centimeter take out that two centimeter and take out the surrounding two centimeter also maybe take out five centimeter total i don't care because even if one is left again the cancer will start again and we cannot afford to do that okay we are playing with life we cannot afford to do that to the humans okay so that is what is called as wide margin excision. We do not want to take a chance. So when the surgeon takes out, let's say, let's take it again. Two centimeter cancer is there. He takes out four centimeter. Now he has taken out four centimeter. He has been very liberal enough to take out cancer. But who knows? Maybe one cancer cell is outside that four centimeter margin. So that is what is going to be told to him by my microscopic eye through the frozen section. If I say, okay, wide margin excision clear, the margins are clear, that there is no cancer left, all the cancer cells are here only, don't worry. If I say wide margin excision is not successful, what he will do is, he has already done the 4 centimeter excision, he will take out maybe one cent from the surrounding area. So that has to be done right at the point of moment. You cannot close a patient and then get him again to the OT. So that is what is important for the section. Uh, some examples of frozen section of an unexpected appendectomy. My purpose was that you had appendicitis, inflammation of the appendix, infection. Of I opened you up for a plain simple reason that I will remove your infected, inflamed appendix. But now, oh, it's a Pandora's box. Let me make it more interesting. Pandora, the famous magician okay, of ancient times, he had a wooden box always in front of him. He was a magician, correct? Very big time magician of his times. Pandora had a wooden box and he was standing behind the box. Somebody from the audience says, Pandora, get a rabbit out of it. He got a rabbit. Pandora, get a lamp out. Pandora, get a bulb out of it. Pandora, get a girl out of it. We used to get a girl out of it. So this is what is called as Pandora's box. The abdomen, what we say, 
in very simple language, the abdomen is stomach area, you know, where your stomach is. Okay. In those ancient days, when we were not allowed to, for various reasons, to open a human body, and we did not have an expertise also to do so, it was a Pandora's box. What is there in it? I do not know. I cannot open it, but then, you know, what will come out of it? I do not know. Today, we are opening up like anything, you know, the times have changed. Okay, coming back to the thing is that you have opened up a patient for some known reason, but now you see, oh, another disease process you see at the time of the operation on the operation table and you do not know what is the disease you never knew it was there in the very first place now who will give the diagnosis you will give me the biopsy from there i'll give through the frozen section what is it and determining upon what is my diagnosis you will decide whether it has to be taken out or it can be treated just by oral medications or it may be necessary to determine if the appropriate tissue has been obtained for further workup of a disease process so these are the various things. Now, this is the most important part of this introductory lecture. As far as step one is stains used in histopathology, they are asking you lots of questions revolving around this, at least three to four questions on step one. Remember, step one is all about patience and perseverance. It's a long exam. In fact, it is the longest exam. There are 46 questions on each block and there are eight blocks. You go in the morning early and when you're coming out, it is dusk. Can you beat it? You're just sitting there doing questions after questions after questions after questions. So I always tell my students, develop a habit of sitting, sitting continuously. Give a sitting for five hours, six hours, seven hours, eight hours. If you cannot, then you will not be able to complete the examination. As I was telling you, USMLE is a very widely researched medical exam. In fact, it is the most foolproof medical exam. Many of the students, nearly 8 to 10 percent of the students are never able to completely answer all the questions out there because they have not practiced questions and there's a way to practice it. As you go through the whole ocean of pathology, I'll take your hand and I'll take you across the ocean of USMB. It's not a difficult exam. It's a very streamlined exam, but it requires a lot of focused, smart approach. Okay, so stays used in it. The most common routine stain used in histopathology worldwide is hematoxylin and eosin. Hematoxylin and eosin. Hematoxylin comes from the bark of a tree called hematoxylin campuchinium. Campuchinium comes from the word Cambodia. Cambodia. Okay, so it is a dye. It is a color. You see, we wear all, it's all about colors. Imagine the world, if it was black and white, how boring it would be. Somebody is wearing green, somebody is wearing blue. India is all about colors, isn't it? Colorful country, colorful world. So these are colors, what we call in pathology as dyes. When I take a section from you, make a slide out of it, if I don't stain it with colors or the dyes, I don't see anything. So I use some colors or dyes. So hematoxylin is a dye or a color coming from of a tree. And eosin is a waste product of the textile industry. Eosin is pink, hematoxylin is blue. So it's all about blue and pink. Histopathology or pathology is a blue and pink world. Blue and pink. All the slides in routine stain called H, hematoxylin and eosin, H and E stain. So this is the most popular routine, regular stain used by the pathologist worldwide for the diagnosis of histological sections. Anyway, now special stains. Special stains, there are so many of them. Special stains, I'll give you examples very shortly. So hematoxylin, you should see these things. Okay, these are basics. Please remember, I put calcium deliberately in red, calcium stains blue under hematoxylin. I deliberately made it red, you can make it blue again. I want that to be done by you. This is what is called as active learning experience when a professor deliberately does a thing which is just opposite to what he wants the uh, student to learn. When the PowerPoint is available to you, make it blue. Because that's a question on the boards. You see, it is coming from the horse's mouth I've been teaching you simply for nearly now 12 years and I've been teaching pathology for nearly now 22 years. So when I say a thing, it happens. Okay, take it from me. So make it blue when the presentation is over. This is a direct question on the boards. What color is the calcium taking on hematoxylin and eosin stains? So that's it. There are many special stains. Other than HND, there are many special stains. There's something called as mucin. It's a substance which is present in the body. Sometimes it is produced used in excessive quantity by mucinous cancers, mucinous adenocarcinomas. It's for mucin, mucic, carmine, pass. Periodic acid skiff. Periodic acid skiff. Skiff is a gentleman's name who 
invented it. Okay, S C H I F F. Please remember, many times in medicine and particularly in pathology, if I discover something or if I invent something which was not there, what is the difference between discovery and invention? By the way, discovery is it was always there, but I didn't know. I discovered it today. Invention is it was never there. I made it today. So whether it is a discovery or invention, the doctors or the scientists or the medical scientists, particularly the pathologists, want to give their own name to it. Okay, so this will keep on occurring. It goes by the name of the this who first described it to the world. Tomorrow, if I discover a a pathological type which was never described in the world, it is seen for the first time by me. I can call it succinus stomach, isn't it? So these are mucin stains, all of them. This is the second question from today's lecture, which is there very popularly again and again repeatedly asked. All these stains are for the mucin. Mucicarmin, yes. Bas, yes. Elsinbu, yes. Which is the best? Typically, the step uses two words. Most, these are the most guarded words in the world for me. Most likely means the best available choice out of whatever is given. The best out of all the words. Are all good or all bad? I don't know. But the best answer is, is most likely is a way of guarding yourself. The step people are clever people, you know. So most likely, so which is answer? Best of these three, music army. That's why I put it first. That's the question number four. You can have a melanin stain. Melanin is a pigment in the skin. The fairer the melanin content is more. Melanin sites which are skin cells. Okay. The special chain for that is Montana Mason stain. Then there is something called as chemosetin iron. It's iron. There are various kinds of iron in the human body. Ferritin is another kind of iron, but ferritin will not be stained. The form of ferritin, F E R R I T I N, cannot be stained. But, but another form called hemosetin is stainable and classical special stain for staining iron in your body in your slides is Prussian blue stain, also called pearl stain. It's also called pearls Prussian blue stain. Okay, the fat stain. Fat can be stained by various other kind of special stains: oil red, o, Sudan black, Sudan four, Sudan four oblique black. So many. Sudan is a country, by the way, in Africa. So it was first invented in Sudan. So in the honor of that country, they call it Sudan black. There are various kinds of connective tissue stains, the trichrome stain. There are two of them, Masson's trichrome stain, Mallory's trichrome stain. You've got Van Giesen stain, you've got reticulin stain. And there is something called as amyloid. A word about amyloid. What is amyloid? First of all, it is a protein. Okay, It's a protein. It's a pathologic. You're not supposed to have amyloid protein in your body if you're healthy. If you're having it, it is a pathology. Amyloid protein is a pathology. Okay, there are various kinds of amyloids. Please remember, amyloid is deposited outside the cell. So it is an extracellular protein deposition. It can be seen in many types of diseases, disease processes, and the special stain for it is called as Congo Red. Now, Congo again is a country in Africa. It was first invented there. Now, it's a very exhaustive list, you know, and I'm not going to go through it. You go through it. I will never ask you literally so much about the details, but I a habit of putting a classification this is high yield this solid high yield this pure meat i'm giving it no bones so if you go through it what i suggest to my so many years now is this is one slide i'm going through it this is another slide this is all special stain slides guys and this is the third slide now this is a lot of information then it will take some time for you to sink it in your brain cells take a printout hard copy and put it on the wall of your study going here there keep on glancing at it it will slowly sink in there it will take some time but this is important this is the eight fundamental concepts of medicine good xyz will never come to you so you have to know certain special stains these are asked on the exams okay so this is for you to remember there's no logic out here this is all you know straightforward mugging up one percent of pathology you have to mug up Moon is round, is round. There's no logic out there. You cannot, you know, say it is a triangle. The moon is round, is round. Ninety-nine percent of pathology is logical. It is the most logical subspecialty of medicine. So this is all mugging up. So you do it on your own. This will be asked on the examination somewhere or the other. I have told you three to four questions. Uh,
there. This is what is called as the acid fast bacilli, the mycobacterium tuberculosis bacilli. These are the pink bacilli. Okay. This is acid fast bacilli stain, the AFB stain. This is typically done for mycobacterium tuberculosis. These are the cells. These are the cells. Okay. These are cells. Don't worry about the cells. This is an overwhelming infection by the mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is bacilli causing the tuberculosis. This particular patient is pulmonary tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is rampant in the eastern part of the world. It's an infection. People are poor, unhygienic conditions. But if you think that the western world is free of tuberculosis, no. Let me tell you a very short story. Huh? In around the early 80s, if I'm not wrong, 1983 to be precise, the HIV virus was discovered and the AIDS came up as a monster, a new devil, which we never knew of. It came from Congo. It came from a monkey. Had it not been the emergence of AIDS in 1983, but 1985, the world was thinking of, was on the edge of wiping away tuberculosis from the face of earth, just as the smallpox has been done. Isn't it? So that is very ironical. This is how life is. So this is tuberculosis. Tuberculosis is seen in Eastern world because of two reasons. Poverty. People People are poor, don't have anything to eat. Immune system is weak. Infection occurs. People are unhygienic. Just because they are unhygienic, they are living in very terrible conditions. Infection is there, they get it. Western part of the world, why you are having so much of tuberculosis? Because western part of the world is having AIDS. A lot of AIDS is there. And AIDS is there, so tuberculosis is there. So tuberculosis is a very important concept even in the USAB. For the reason that there are lots of tuberculosis patients Tuberculosis in the western part of the world, AIDS. Acquired immunodeficiency syndrome caused by human immunodeficiency virus. Now, this is the Congo red stain for the amyloids. So, please remember this is a blood vessel out here. Basically, this is a liver section. This is a liver section. These are the images, if you can see them. Okay, these are polygonal incise, and this is a blood vessel out here. Blood vessel wall is so thickened. See the thickness of the blood vessel wall. It's huge. You can put a helicopter here so thick why is it so thick because i put an extra cellular protein an extra burden on it yeah. see the thickness this part of the wall is still spared this part of the wall is still spared is it? so this is amyloid so this is a congo red stain it was discovered in congo invented in congo sorry and it gives a red stain but still if i'm not convinced what i can do is i can take a polarizer now what is a polarizer have you ever seen a biscuit Let's talk about the very basic biscuit of India. Parleji. Okay, so that is a biscuit kind of a small thing. And I put it on my light source of the light microscope. I put it on my light source of my light microscope. Okay. And then build the same patient. Magic. Magic happens. So when I put the polarized out there, shining on my slide. Now, what do you mean by polarized light? When the sun comes out, typically they show in the movies. Oh, the sun is coming up. The rays are going here, there, everywhere, 360 degree. The sunlight is going in all 360 degree direction. When I put this polarized light, or when I put this polarizer, the light gets polarized. Basic physics concepts, sixth grade physics concept, light moves only in one direction. That is what is called as polarized light. And that gives me a yellow, yellow green, green bifringes. Hello, bifringes. So this is yellow green bifringes, which is seen out here. The apple green bifringes. So I'm now very 100% sure that this is amyloid and nothing else. Because I have to be sure, guys, if I say breast cancer in the morning to the turning out to be breast cancer in the evening when I get the breast, it is not good. Not good for me at least, not good for the patient. So we do not have a second chance in the subject called medicine. Medicine is all about the first and last chance. You cannot be wrong. You cannot be wrong. People go wrong and then they have to pay for the consequences. We do not want that. And another example of amyloid in the Alzheimer's disease. By the way, Alzheimer's disease is a pandemic of 21st, 21st century. Alzheimer's is an old person's disease. Remember the geriatric age group. Now, what do you mean by geriatric and pediatric age group? Old people in medicine is defined as 65 plus. And pediatric basically means children. Children, according to medicine, is just before puberty. That is around 12 to 13 years. Okay. Okay. So let's talk about the geriatric 
disease called Alzheimer's. The older you are, more are the chances of getting this Alzheimer's disease. Ironically, you see, I'm very interested in the social context of medicine. When, when, a, when a father is there, when the father is young, the son is dependent. So dependent. Now, father is 75, 80 plus son is not bothered about it. What is happening to this strange world? Times have changed. People are being used and things are being thrown. So this is not good. So Alzheimer's is rampant. It has been termed as the silent pandemic of the 20. Why is it called silent? Because it is underdiagnosed. Father, grandfather is saying, I'm losing my memory. He's putting his sort of specs every, everywhere in the house. He's not being taken care of. So Alzheimer's is rampantly increasing in this world. Anyway, so coming back to there is a deposition of this extracellular protein in Alzheimer's disease also, wherein the main symptom of Alzheimer's disease is loss of memory, loss of memory, gross loss of memory. It can be so bad that the old man can come to a terminal stage of Alzheimer's where he doesn't know even if he's living or not. What is he? Who is he? Is not what is he? Is he there? He's totally lost. Anyway. So amyloid, this is the amyloid out here. This is the kidney out here. So this is the kidney out here. So this is the, see, think, this is the, this is the congruent. See this congruent, same section. When I put a polarizer, it becomes polarized. Apple green by refringence, yellow green by refringence. This is very, very commonly asked concept. What is the special strain for, con for amyloid? There are certain strains for microorganisms. We are an organism. We can be seen by naked eye but there are certain organisms which are so small that you can't see them i have to use a microscope that as a group there are many microorganisms you've got bacteria you've got viruses you've got parasites you've got helminths you've got so many microorganisms i'll get as a group bacteria are the maximum in number by vote they win by voting process in the democracy world of microorganisms bacteria are the max okay followed by viruses so how to strain a bacteria? The basic strain for bacteria is what is called as gram strain. Gram strain comes from the word or the person who first invented it, Christian Gram. His name was Christian Gram. So I've told you names. Similarly, many names are there out here. Warthin Starry Silver Stain. That is a person's name, Warthin Starry. It is a silver stain. We use silver in it. Yes, the same silver used by the jewelers. We strain it for H. pallery. Helicobacter pallery, a word about it. Oh my God, this has become a global problem now. Because if the big brother called the United States of America is not happy, whether you believe it or not, it will have impact on the globe. It has an impact on the globe. So please remember, every third American has got this helicobacter pallery in abundance in his stomach. And this causes havoc in the gastrointestinal system. Cancer? Yes. Ulcer? Yes. Inflammation? Yes. It's an infection? Yes. And every third American is having it. So America is struggling under this burden of helicobacter pallery. And that's not good. And it can be also used for so spirochetes. Spirochetes is another kind of microorganism group. Some of the famous ones are spirochetes are Tryponema pallidum, which causes syphilis. That is a sexually transmitted infection. Okay, it goes by unsafe sex. Then there is something called as Borrelia burgdorf, causes the Lyme's arthritis or the Lyme's disease. So these are the famous ones as far as step one is concerned and we are not going into details when i do the organ systems individually we'll talk about all the disease processes then there is a afb stain acid fast bacilli stain it is also called as zil nielsen stain these are the two people who are also called z n stain z n stain so you don't have so much long long names time is not there for a doctor z n stain it is basically for mycobacterium tuberculosis what we were just talking about then we have got a Mycophyte stain again, these are people's name. This is for staining what is called as mycobacterium leprae, which causes leprosy, isn't it? Remember, guys, there's no way that you can escape these stains because it is all about what is pathology. Very interestingly, I say to my students, pathology is the photography of medicine. I just do photography of the medicine, and that is pathology. How do I do pathology without my stains? So these stains are something like A, B, and C. I have to do photography. For doing photography of medicine, I have to use some colors. And these are the colors. Very, very important. There's no way. I mean, this is, if there are 150 students in my class, 50 have to know it. 
If they don't know it, something deep, deeply wrong, deeply wrong. Because you cannot move. It is something like, you know, you have got a car without gas. You cannot move a car without gas. Anyway, so this is something which has to be learned, remember, memorized. There is no escaping. Now another special saying out here is called Gomori Methana means silver stain. All these are people saying GMS stain for the fungi I was previously known as Pneumocystis carinae. Now the terminology for Pneumocystis carinae is Pneumocystis gerogosai. Please remember Pneumocystis that is pneumonia. Pneumo, pneumo means pneumo means air. Greek, it's all Greek guys because of Alexander the Great. He Wandered around the world, captured nearly 70% of the world. His language was Greek, his people were Greek, his doctors, his ancient scientists speaking Greek. So, medicines spread far and wide thanks to his capture. If you think about it, had he been sitting only in Greece, medicine would not have been what it is today. One of the, if I can say, silver rays of his darker side of life was that he at least wandered around, captured people, medicines spread like wildfire and because he was a greek it spread in the words of greek and latin this is gomara metha means silver state let's go further so pneumo means air ia means a condition ia in greek means a condition so it's not a good uh, word the latest word is pneumonitis what condition of lung pneumo air lung lung condition of lung no itis itis is a suffix used in pathology for inflammation of lung so pneumonitis is a better word. Well, coming back to the point, pneumocystis gerogosai or pneumocystis carinae, pneumonia is most common AIDS patients. Remember, AIDS is a pandemic today. There is no country spread of AIDS today. Okay. Another special stain is called periodic acid. Skiff skiff is a gentleman's name. It stains glycogen, mucin, and fungi. Especially, it is used for the staining of the basement membrane and capsules. Okay, so we are going to do all of these things in great details. Hematology, him, H E A, him basically means in Greek, red. What is red in your body? Which is running like a rocket in the cardiovascular system, blood. Hemato, blood. Logic, logy, study of blood. Hematology, study of blood. Stains for hematology, hematological stains. There are four important ones. I, I was saying the HND stain is the most common routinely histopathologically used in worldwide. The most common stain used in hematology worldwide is the right gymsa stain. Those are two people's stain. Okay, you can have a right stain separately, you can have a gymsa stain, you mix both of them, you get a right gymsa stain. This is used for staining the peripheral blood smears. Have you ever been to a lab to give a blood specimen for some kind of a lab test? So you must be remembering, they expose your left or right hand and then they tie a tourniquet so that the veins come up prominently. They become more predominant and then the technician puts a needle into a vein and the blood is drawn. That's the question on the board. Which is that vein to be pierced most commonly in the hand to draw the peripheral blood? Hands are peripheral. The trunk, the body. The stomach area, what we call abdomen, the back, the chest, this is central. The limbs, lower extremities, upper extremities, this is peripheral, isn't it? So peripheral blood is drawn from which vein? Anti-cubital vein, not anti. A-N-T-E, anti-cubital vein is the answer. Okay, so for all those peripheral blood smears, right, gym size is free. There is a special thing called a leukocyte alkaline phosphatase. Which leukocyte? That's another question. Neutrophil. Well, there are five kinds of leukocytes. We are talking about the neutrophil over here. So, this is a leukocyte alkaline phosphatase stain. Neutrophil alkaline phosphatase stain. To differentiate a leukemia, what kind of leukemia? Chronic myeloid leukemia from what is called as a leukemoid reaction. Okay. So, now let's do in two lines. What is leukemoid reaction and what is leukemia? There are various kinds of leukemias, guys. More than 200 plus. Okay, one of them is chronic myeloid. Okay, just remember the name as well. We are just doing the fundamental concepts. So, need not go into details. What is leukemia? Leukemia cancer. The most common cancer in the children worldwide. It's supposed to be the most common cancer in children worldwide, leukemia. The most common solid cancer in children worldwide, brain cancers. Blood is liquid. So, see the difference. Minor difference. Last line, if you are not reading properly, what is being asked to you? Are they asking your father's name or your uncle's name? 
they are very very clever people okay i will not say they want to trick you but they also want to make sure what is your alertness level you see a doctor has to be alert all the time they cannot be acting lousy and that is what is tested out there all the answer choices will be orangeish they will never put an orange with an avocado and a banana and an apple all of them will look orangeish all of them will be orangeish the beauty is how to get to the correct answer it is all about diagnosis if you think about it all those answer choices are what differential diagnosis and the correct choice is what diagnosis isn't it so please try to remember there is something called as leukemia this is blood cancer and there is something called as leukemoid reaction now oid if you see the suffix out here this is called oid oid in greek means resembling reminding mimicking something okay so it mimics leukemia so that is why it is called leukemoid reaction but it is not leukemia it is not cancer what is it well it is a very very severe infection by some organism usually a bacteria okay so to differentiate between this chronic myeloid leukemia and leukemoid reaction in both the cases the leukocytes which leukocytes the neutrophils will be very very high in number in the blood but if the leukocyte alkaline phosphatase stain lap stain also called nowadays nap and for neutrophil alkaline phosphatase stain if the cells neutrophils are taking a scan staining that means it is cancer they are taking scan staining they are cancerous cells they will not take it they are normal cells whereas if it is a just sheer increase in number of the neutrophils to give a fight to the infection that is increased in number but they are normal they are not cancer they will take an intense stain so the beautiful concept here you see i tell my techie go johnny get the alkaline phosphatase done here i think it might be leukemia it might be leukemoid reaction i am confused i cannot take second chances in medicine guys so i have to be really very sure before i commit myself so I, if it comes very scan staining or it is leukemia it is blood cancer now see the prognosis we were talking about the prognosis cml leukemia leukemia oh you are going to die chances are super duper right you will be expiring very soon it is cancer guys whereas leukemoid reaction oh i will give you antibiotics no matter what i will give you a cocktail of antibiotics i'll give you iv antibiotics i'll give you intrathecal antibiotics i'll give you lots of antibiotics high dose antibiotics intense aggressive antibiotic therapy i'll give you you will come out of it okay so the prognosis of leukemoid reaction infection is obviously very good as compared to a cancer another one is tartrate resistant acid phosphatase stain oh, such a long name when you become a doctor you don't have time you have many things of life but you don't have time for yourself remember this okay so we call them in short trap this is a trap stain okay very simple trap stain very nice so this trap stain is for the hairy cell leukemia now why is it called hairy cell well does it have hair on it no but if you look at the individual cell of this particular leukemia in your light microscopy it appears to be having certain projections which are vertical on the surface of the cell do this over for yourself make a circle if you are listening all of you who are listening make a circle on a paper if you have and just put some projections which are vertically standing on the surface of that circle on the periphery of that circle okay that is how the cell looks like and that is why it is called hairy cell leukemia and the special stain for bringing out this with a lot of confidence and conviction before you sign it out is the trap stain trap stain positive if somebody says to me from dar es salaam tanzania i will say trap came positive oh you saw a hcl today very good congratulations hairy cell leukemia so this is what is called as pathognomonic stain trap positive means only one diagnosis in the world hairy cell leukemia there is no other diagnosis period i just walked away Another stains up myeloperoxidase stains and pseudomonas black stains. These are for the myeloblasts. Myeloblast. Now please remember, blast is a suffix used for ancestral cells or the primitive cells. Site means mature cell. Blast means mother cell. Blast is the mother cell. Mother gives birth to a daughter. That daughter it. myeloblast is the mother. Myelocyte is the child. Okay. Lymphoblast is the mother cell. Gives birth to Called lymphocyte. So this is the concept of blast. Well, see, this is the peripheral blood smear. Simple peripheral blood smear. These, these are the RBCs. You see these pink ones. The nice, beautiful RBCs out there. What is the shape of the RBC? The shape of RBC is very interesting. You see the beauty of the Almighty. The biggest physician in the world is Almighty. Okay, and he will always remain, remain the same. Okay, never ever try to play God, guys. 
you're a doctor you might play a demigod but never try to play god it's all about being humble that should be the attitude if you want to practice medicine we practice medicine okay we practice the word itself is so humbling we practice medicine okay we are playing with human bodies so we have to do it very very carefully anyway so what is the size of the rbc rbcs are biconcave in size every book says that biconcave now practicing what is biconcave it's slightly difficult i cannot show you the biconcavity of the rbc because this is a two dimensional thing it is not three dimensional and biconcave basically means a three dimensional structure world cup tomorrow is the final correct stadium that stadium is the biconcave structure that is the shape of rbc can imagine you are seeing cricket okay at kings kensington oval in barbados that stadium the very shape of the stadium is that of a rbc such a beautiful shape it is and other thing is it doesn't have a nucleus good news bad news very good news why because if the stadium is empty what is the function of rbc it contains hemoglobin hemoglobin what is the function of hemoglobin hemoglobin carries oxygen we need lot of oxygen we live on oxygen we take an oxygen we survive okay so had there been a nucleus some of it some of the surface area would have been taken away by that nucleus we don't want that why do you it so he removed the nucleus of a mature rbc so that more hemoglobin is there and more oxygen is carried effectively to the organs and the humans are happy so all these pink ones you know these are rbcs Central one third is pale as compared to the peripheral two third. The central one third is pale. This is called as paler. This is normal. Up to one third, it's okay. If it is more than one third, that means hemoglobin is less. You got anemia. Anemia means lack of two to the RBC is because the hemoglobin is pink. Correct? Okay. Now this is a neutrophil. This is a neutrophil. See, it is bilobed. You you are using earphones. some of you must be using earphones so this is earphone shaped you understand headphone shaped so bilobed one lobe this is the bridge out here this is three lobes one two three these are neutrophils and what are these what are these little little clumps see guys what are these clumps little ones these are platelets are these carry oxygen neutrophils lymphocyte monocyte eosinophil basophil there are five of them these are leukocytes these fight infections this is the infantry of our body you put an infection in the body, body will fight back they will fight the war okay whatever you put cancer they will fight a war they will fail that is a different thing correct they will fail but they will give up a fight so these are the fighter cells of the, the leukocytes one of the main leukocytes is being shown here the two lobed neutrophil and the three lobed neutrophil and what is the function of platelets you get a cut early morning you are going to the medical school you are getting late while shaving you cut your left cheek you get a little neck and the blood starts you press it for a while it stops who stops it platelets along with the clotting factors and this is the function of platelet there are only three cell lines in the peripheral blood smear the rbcs the wbcs one of the wbcs neutrophils are being shown here and these are the platelets nice this is right stain and there are certain immunohistochemical stains also called as immunoperoxidase or antibody stains and there are various stains out here For staining cytokeratin, for the epithelial cells, we have got cytokeratin stains. For mesenchymal cells, we have got vermentin stain. For skeletal muscle, we have got desmin stain. For melanocytes, which make melanin in our skin, giving us the complexion of the skin. I do not use the word color. You see, when you are actually as a responsible physician, professor, no matter what, to use your English when in public, very guarded. Okay, so color. is a racist kind of a thing we use the word complexion correct okay? we will learn these things okay these are minor things of life we will all grow together okay so for melanocytes hmb45 for glial tissue glial tissue is basically brain tissue we have got s100 so you have to remember these are the special stains immunostic chemical stains still continuing lca leukocyte common antigen also called as cd45 for lymphocytes there are two types of lymphocytes the t lymphocytes and the b lymphocyte t stands for thymus up to what age is the thymus present in a child and then it vanishes slowly up to pubertal age up to pubertal age what is pubertal age well it cannot be written in signature because it is different from different uh, countries different people different species but by and large 
puberty is defined as the appearance of secondary sexual characteristics and the first secondary sexual characteristic in a male when we say oh my boy is going into manhood is the change in the voice of a boy deepening of the voice in a male means he is approaching his entry the manhood from puberty that is puberty for a girl it is a budding of the breast it is called budding of the breast develop a little little budding of the breast breasts are coming out okay so that is thymus goes away around 12 to 13 years of age it just comes to my mind there is a question on the boards if the thymus persist doesn't go away when the child has reached the pubertal age what what can happen next thymoma thymoma is a cancer of thymus that is a question on the boards so t for thymus b for not bone marrow many of you might be thinking or have been taught wrong that is bone marrow b not for bone marrow b for bursa bursa b u r s a of fabricus that is a gentleman the bursa of fabricus is in humans it is in birds so the b lymphocytes ironically for the first time were discovered in birds not in humans later on they found oh my god similar cells are also found in the humans see the medical literature is so interesting if you go into it it's like an addiction so bursa of in god's fact that is called as b lymphocyte so there are certain there are numbers to them cd4 cd5 cd is not for cold ring guys c clean is cluster designate now let me cut the story very short story is very simple there are thousands of molecules in the world of medicine thousands of tumor markers are there thousands of stains i call it a from india the same thing you call from australia as b the same one from congo you say c same one says from america it is d someone says lot of confusion we are not on the same page lot of chaotic environment globe is now shrinking we are a very small world i have to take an opinion from others they have to talk to me from other country if we are not on the same page i say a for the same molecule you said b how will we understand it to get rid of this confusion they held a conference way back in i think 2000 and they said you know what let's just get rid of this confusion so that we come on the same page and we talk the same language we understand this a is a is a for everyone it is a this molecule is called a so if you see leukocyte common antigen somebody was saying somebody was saying something for that somebody was saying. so what they said is let's do what is called as cluster designate and they randomly chose all these molecular put them how many are there okay 1 billion are there put them put them on paper randomly you put them we have to start with some molecule okay give this first molecule whatever we have written cd1 2 3 4 5 6 7. can you beat it it has been nearly now 20 years and they have not been able to give the numbers to all of them till date they are giving numbers you know so that is the concept of cluster designate now how to remember these i can help you with them the t lymphocytes have small numbers see 4 5 8 8 as compared to 19 20 21 are small so b are big numbers 19 20 21 b for big b for big i do all these tricks okay and they will come very handy when you take the exam my students tell me till date there are so many of them there are so many of them out there more than 1000 across the globe across the globe and when they call me they say dr saxena we still can hear your voice when you used to lecture that is that is something you know you have to remember you have to remember there is no choice and i will give you all sorts of tricks hints level i'm nothing you know what is a professor and we are very personal of you very humbly i speak i am just a senior student of medicine trying to take a junior student of medicine like you across this vast ocean of knowledge okay. so neuron specific knowledge nse this is for the neuroendocrine cells okay there are many kinds of neuroendocrine tumors out there cancers it's an enzyme let me tell you clarify here any suffix with an a is in pathology means an enzyme okay what is enzyme basically it is a catalyst for reactions we are nothing but a bundle of nothing but a bundle of emotions what is emotion in a human it's a reaction so there are a lot of biochemical reactions occurring at the cellular level in us which is which is making us laugh which is making us um, uh, weep which is 
excited, which is making us angry, panicking, nothing but a reaction. So please remember neuroendocrinal tumors basically you've got the specific presence of neuron specific enolase and enzyme. Okay, all these reactions are occurring at super duper high high speed, high five speed. Otherwise, who's making them occur at such a rocket speed? Enzymes. Remove the reactions will not occur. If a reaction, if I can say so, is occurring, let's say one reaction, whatever reaction is occurring in nanoseconds, if I remove that enzyme, and that happens in many disease processes, that reaction will never occur even in 2000 years. It is so slow. So enzymes are very important. Okay. They catalyze reaction. They accelerate reactions. So this is one of the enzymes. Prostate specific antigen, the PSA, it is raised in many prostate pathologies. Prostate is a gland. Only in males, the function of prostate is what? Any idea? The function of two secrete secretions, which are helpful during the sexual intercourse. The other thing is that the prostate also gives something what is called as a sugar called as fructose, which is very important for the sperm movement. Then there are certain stains used in cytopathology for the staining of the cells. The May Grunwald Jimsa stain. These are people's name, right stain. Again, there's the right stain for the hematology. There is the right stain for cytopathology. And then there's something called as Papanicolaou stain. Okay, so this is Dr. Papanicolaou who gave the stain. And this stain is a cervical stain. Cervical basically means cervical stain. So we take it from the anterior, the posterior and the lateral walls of the vagina. Okay, and then we stain it. So this is the normal pap smear, the pinkish ones. These are the more mature, orangish, reddish once the mature orangish reddish ones are the mature ones and the bluish ones the bluish greenish cells this is the mature see mature orangish reddish centrally placed small compact nucleus cytoplasm is whereas the bluish greenish kind of cells these are the immature cells cervical epithelial cells the nucleus is slightly larger and opened up as compared to the nucleus of the mature orange reddish cell the point comes why are we doing the pap smear why are we taking the smear from that cervical area of a female to rule out cancer well before the pap smear cervical cancer was very very fatal because people came to know that they have a cancer at a very late stage you can't do anything it has already metastasized it has gone from here to breast it has gone to ovary it has gone to back now the current regimen says or foundation by the who in the western part of the world especially is that after 20 get it done every three years after 40 definitely once in a year to rule out what cervical cancer so these are the cancer guys these are cancer cells see this one what did i tell you in the previous slide also not this previous one previous to previous so this is all pleomorphic cells different size different shape nobody looks like any other so this is see what has happened to it looks very cross angry looking cells this cell is very different from this cell. so this is what is called as pleosis occurring can you see guys if you remember your biology days see this is one see this is budding out you see yeah, see this budding out okay, this is a typical mitosis one cell is becoming two cell what is cancer one cell becomes one to two two to four four eight eight sixteen sixteen thirty two keep on doing it it becomes one billion one day that is cancer isn't it? So, little dysplastic cells. Now, there is something called as ancillary te techniques, which are special techniques which are used in pathology. They are not used routinely for plain simple reasons. They are expensive. expensive. No money, no honey. 80% of the world, according to WHO, 2017 report is still poor, guys. Don't think about the Big Apple and Melbourne and New Delhi. 80% of the world is still poor. And ironically, people who are sick are generally poor. I'm not ruling out that rich people are sick, sick people are usually poor people. Why they are sick? Because they were poor. Yes. So ancillary techniques have to be used very judiciously. You know, you cannot use it uh, rampantly. You can't afford to use it. So immunofluorescent microscopy is used for kidney raised kidney. Rain comes from reno. Areno means kidney in Greek. Means kidney in Greek. So renal disease, autoimmune diseases. Autoimmune diseases, your body has a tendency to make autoantibodies against his own organ. Then you've got an electron microscopy. 
Well, in the Armored Armed Forces Medical College, we went to microscopy. I was lucky enough to get trained on it. You know, it's great to have an electron microscope by your side. How big is the electron microscope? Well, it is as big as your bedroom, if I can say. Okay, you walk into it, you sleep into it. It is so huge, an electron microscope is huge. It's like a room. This is also used for diagnosis of kidney disease and neoplasm. Neoplasm. Neo means new Greek. Neo Greek. Plasma means growth. New growth. New growth basically means tumor. It can be benign tumor. Tumor is what is called carcinoma. Common man on the road says cancer. So all these things. Then you've got molecular techniques like protein electrophoresis. You've got southern blot, northern blot, western blot, polymerase chain reaction. Very, very hi-fi and expensive kind of things so this is even a fluorescent microscopy here no you know fluorescent colors isn't it fluorescent shiny so this is the oramine stain this is a step question again this is the mycobacterium tuberculosis which i showed you over there in the zn stain the zeal nelson stain i can resort to even for some microscopy you see most of the things what you do as a physician guys you should listen very carefully you do for your conviction for your confidence gaining using johnny's money you are spending johnny's money for first you to get confidence i am right because you cannot afford to be wrong that is the irony of life using his patient's mention the diagnosis should not be wrong treatment should not be wrong so this is what i mean or i mean stain is used for the mycobacterium tuberculosis these white white little little rods these are the acid fast bacilli the so-called mycobacterium tuberculosis this is the lung section out here and this is the or i mean stain a u r a m i n e as you go through the pathology I would like to ask all of you to make a separate PowerPoint of the pictures of USMLE exam. You have to make a USMLE PowerPoint picture PowerPoint. Separate one. I'll keep on pointing. This is USMLE picture. Time to time, whenever it is here. And at the end of the whole pathology course, you will have around 120 pictures in that PowerPoint. And that will come very handy. Okay? That will come very handy. Even if you get 8 or 10 out of them, your life will be far better off than people who are not making this PowerPoint. I literally know pictures have seen because I've seen the USM for so many years. So make that PowerPoint when I ask you to make it. Okay. So what is the finest filter in the world is kidney. And what part of the kidney is the filter? This is the glomerulus. What is this glomerulus? It is a tuft of capillary, basically the wall of capillaries through which the blood is going, 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 going. It is going. How many liters of blood in a body? Five liters of blood. How many times does it pass the two kidneys in 24 hours? Oh my God, 80 times. So how many times? How many liters are passed? Five liters. 400 liters are crossed. Your 400 liters of blood has crossed your kidney in 24 hours and ultimately making what? Urine. Urine is how much? 1.5 to 2 liters. See the fineness of this filter. 400 liters filtered filters. In my very personal opinion, man will never be able to duplicate this kind of filter. Dr. Vinay, a good friend of mine, who is the chief editor of Robbins for many years now, okay, he has written certain lines which are so beautiful in Robbins. Robbins is the Bible of pathology at your level for the step. He has written, he opens up the kidney chapter by saying something like this, that what a filter this kidney is, it converts the wine of Shiraz into urine like magic. Now, what is wine of Shiraz? Wine of Shiraz is the most complicated wine in the world in terms of the ingredients put into it. Okay, so It can filter little, little things, little, little things and make it urine. So this is what is being shown over here. These are the linear immune deposits which are seen in a disease called good pasture syndrome eyes here see this one is normal see the green hue out here is dark it is dark this is also normal see as a pointer goes i hope everybody is seeing okay see this one shiny there is a fluorescent hue to this green see this one fluorescent hue to this green see this one fluorescent hue to this these are the linear immune complex deposits antigen antibody deposits in the glomerulus seen in a disease called good pasture syndrome which is a kidney disease wow what is this this is mitochondria smiley you guys give smiley on the whatsapp to each other so this is the happy mitochondria 
well this is one mitochondria this is another mitochondria this is another mitochondria these little little spaces if you know your biology from your 10th grade these are the cristae remember making a mitochondria with the ridges like this and you call it mitochondrial cristae so this is electron microscopy guys electron microscopy pictures are black and white but recently around 6 months back i read in a journal time is going to come very soon when the electron microscopy will also go colored so that will be nice isn't it so this is another mitochondria another mitochondria and this is another mitochondria this is from my usmly uh, this is from my afmc days you know when, when we used to get trained for the session for how to use an electron microscope it just so happened that i saw this under my supervisor and i thought it looks something very happy kind of a thing so i just took a photograph from my archives okay so these are three different my mitochondria but it appears as a smiley circuit so i am happy mitochondria i have called this picture as happy mitochondria for long two decades or more there another electron microscopy feature out here which is showing the neuro secretory granules so see these dark circles some are small some are big these are the dark neuro secretory granules which is in neuro endocrine pathologies typically neuro endocrine tumors and the special stain this is electron microscopy black and white okay these are the dark neuro secretory granules dark neuro secretory granules and what do they contain they special enzyme what did i tell you neuro neuron specific enolase nse now let's do question and answers u assembly is never going to ask you state questions okay they will never ask how old are you the papa's name no. they, they will create a clinical scenario the whole idea of u assembly is very logical as you read this question with me or when i read it out to you idea is very clear what is the idea this question is not a question it is a clinical scenario it is as if the patient is there in front of you with actual story of his what happened to him what happened to him did you do and what did you do and how did you do so it is clinical okay they will never ask you anything you cannot pass you simply if you are trying to be a rote learner rote memory is not going to work rote memory basically means mugging up what we call as mugging illogically i have mugged up everything i do not understand anything i just you know just illogically i just you know vomiting will not help it is not vomiting which will help okay it is not that you have just eaten everything and uh, you over and vomit there no that will not work that doesn't work in usmle okay so usmle question starts with the age okay and then the story builds up age will always be there so let's do this one you will understand better when i go and do further questions a 49 year old female <clears throat> presents with a cold thyroid nodule the fine needle aspiration cytology reveals medullary carcinoma of thyroid that is a cancer of thyroid a thyroid biopsy is done by me and i see tumor cells with extensive amyloid pink hue to it okay so what special stain is most likely to be used in the thyroid biopsy answer is congo red for some reason this is a flap here answer is congo red as we have discussed before isn't it so the answer is the correct answer is congo red we discussed this before this is congo red what i am showing you this is all congo red this is all amyloid or amyloid amyloid but if i am not sure i want to be sure guys medicine doesn't give a second chance i told you we are doctors okay we are playing with human lives so you have to be very careful what else can i do further second order question on step what else can you do congo red with the polarized light that will give apple green by refringence so correct answer is congo red another question is 64 year old male presents with complaints of increasing abdominal girth his abdomen is increasing in size yellow sclera sclera is the white part of the eye it is always white for every one of us people can be different sclera is always white. it has become yellow his skin is more darker than before physical examination reveals an enlarged liver erased serum bilirubin blood glucose level all this is okay you might not be understanding what i am speaking but this is a special stain kind of a question i have done a biopsy of the liver which demonstrates increased iron content so what special stain is likely to be used in the liver biopsy so simply i am asking you what is a special stain for iron what is a special stain for hemosiderin answer is russian blue or the pearls russian blue this is how the questions come you see they will not directly ask you what is a special stain for iron no that doesn't happen in usmle you will always create a clinical scenario 
Okay, and you have to be good fast reader, guys. English has to be improved. If it is not improved, even I'm from India. You understand that. But we have to work upon it, and the English has to be read fast, impeccable. Okay, certain English words are very commonly used on the assembly, which will be told to you from time to time, and you have to understand the meaning. Example, accentuation means increase, attenuation means decrease. Now, you cannot ask in the exam what is accentuation attenuation doesn't work that way exam is exam. so next question let's do further okay so there's another clinical scenario out here a 66 year old male comes to the emergency department with complaints of acute chest pain he's diagnosed with a myocardial infarction that is a heart attack and he dies autopsy confirms the diagnosis he died of heart attack shows a soft yellow enlarged liver microscopy shows vacuoles within hepatocytes compressing and displacing the nucleus to the periphery of the hepatocytes basically there is a lot of fat which has got deposited there is fat in medicine is called lipid so much of fat has got deposited in the hepatocyte it displaces it compresses and displaces the centrally placed nucleus of the hepatocyte to the periphery because it just pushes it pressure so much of fat is there inside this liver this is a fatty liver case so again coming from the Whole thing, what special stage is most like to, likely to be used in this liver biopsy? Is it so? You have to be a fast reader, guys. You have to be a smart reader. I've told simply are never able to finish it. If you see, there are so many distractors in this question. Nobody is interested in the upper story. The last story, last line is what is important. So if you are not able to read it, you will lose time, you will lose questions, isn't it? If you look at it, simply what they are asking is. That is what is the scene. The scene is very clear. Scene is clinical scenario. And if you are a lousy English reader and you can't reach up to that level, you will. There is a typical time period for every block, guys. 46 questions, these many minutes. How many minutes? 80 seconds per question is the time limit. And if you think 80 seconds is very long, guys. The people who know the answer know it in the first 30 seconds. It is not me. Scientific researchers have proven. If you don't know it, do the next question. Don't sit on it like a duck. It is waste of time. You will never be able to see the other questions. Maybe you would have known some of the answers to those questions. So these are some things I will do on a daily basis. And every lecture I take, I'll give keep on giving you. Don't get sentimentally trapped in a question if you're not getting an answer. 80 seconds is one question. Not more than 80 seconds. Okay, another thing is 46 questions are then one. Question the timing for that block suppose you are on the 40th question zero and the time is finished it automatic second block you have lost those six questions the timing is very important guys the timing is very important alertness is very important reading english is very important fast reading english is very important clinical solving is not so easy guys so what i am trying to bring out is that you have to practice questions and i'll give you a lot of questions from time to time way how to practice questions i'll give you a magic formula I have devised a method over all these years how to make the questions your professor in the absence of professor. Your question becomes your professor. If I teach you 10 concepts in two hours, like today, you will learn 50 concepts in two hours from your questions. Timing is only two hours, correct? Either I teach you 10 concepts as a professor, live professor, or you do 50 questions in two hours and get 50 concepts. Which 10 concepts or 50 concepts. That technique I will tell you. It is a time tested technique. So, what all we have? It is simply asking what is the special stain for fat or lipid? Oil red oil. Man has died, autopsy done, 91 year old male, only 200 grams. What is the normal weight of a normal heart? Reference range of a normal adult 70 kg male is 300 to 350 grams. So, this is very small. Heart. Myocardium is firm dark brown color throughout cardiac microscopy is seen there so what is this he's a 90 90 year old man guys remember there is something called as lipofuscin lipofuscin is also called as lipochrome it is also called as aging pigment it is also called as wear and tear pigment this is a assembly question guys very popular okay as we are aging remember your grandfather when he was young tall handsome no wrinkles walking straight okay now when he's old what happens to him he shrinks He's stooping. He has got wrinkles all over his face. His body is weaker. What has happened? Atrophy. Every machine undergoes atrophy, guys. We are all undergoing atrophy. 
In fact, there is the atrophic theory of aging. Okay. A time will come. We are so atrophic, we die. We are cells. Cells die. There is no cell which is living for all the life, all the lifetime to come. Correct. So this lipophoskin, this yellow brown granular material, which is here, there, everywhere. This is a cardiac biopsy. This is what is called as lipophoskin. The man is 91 year old, have a heart. He has lived for 91 years old. So literally, he has got light. Lots of atrophy in his body, in every organ in his body, he's having a lot of atrophy. Now, which is the only organ which beeps or which works 24-7, 365 days a year, no seven day from birth to grave. The heart. He's the hardest working chap. Okay. So he is having more of atrophy. He has done it for 91 years now. So atrophy is the key answer. Atrophy and product is called life of a skin. It is something like you take a sugar cane, a very basic example I'm giving you. Take a sugar cane, put it in the machine to take out a sugar cane juice. Juice comes here and the sugar cane, after the machine has taken it into juice, what happens to it? That is what is called atrophy. Simple concept. Product is that product. Good sugar cane has gone into the machine and the one which is coming out from the other side is the atrophic sugar cane. And the atrophic sugar cane, the hallmark of atrophy, the end product of atrophy, the garbage left out of that sugar cane is seen as what is called as lipophoskin, also called lipochrome, also called aging pigment, also called wear and tear pigment. Wear and tear pigment. Is it there in you and me also? Yes. But as you are aging, it is increasing. In fact, if it is a 90-year-old man, as I'm saying, 90% of his body weight is nothing but lipophoskin. The maximum lipophoskin is getting deposited in which organ? Heart. Why? Because it is working like mad. Continuous 24-7, 365 days a year. Okay. Which part of the heart, which cell of the heart? Third order question. These are all step questions, guys. Which, which, which cell? Which cell? Cardiac myocyte. Cardiac myocyte. Remember, cell is a pump. Uh, heart is a pump. It pumps blood to all the organs. Isn't it? So it's a pump. Who can pump? Only muscle. So it's a involuntary muscle. Isn't it? Specialized muscle. So cardiac, cardiac, cardia, cardia, heart. Myocyte, muscle cell. Cardiac myocyte, which part of the cardiac myocyte is the life of a skin on the step? See, nitty gritty has gone are those days. The superficial concepts are, they are asking you very specific third order, fourth order questions. The poles of the, the poles, it can be upper pole, it can be lower pole of the cardiac myocyte. And the special stain for this life of a skin is zeal Nielsen stain. Some flap is here, I cut again. So we'll take care of this in the future lectures. Okay. So zeal Nielsen stain, ZN stain. Yes, the same one which is also going to stain the mycobacterium tuberculosis. Okay. So to cut the story short, see, the whole story is so long. But what is being asked is very simple. So you have to be a fast eater, guys. 17-year-old female with a physician with complaints of one month history of fever, weight loss, night sweats, and a lack of blood tends sputum or temperatures 101 degrees Fahrenheit. Crackles of auscultation. A chest X-ray shows a two centimeter cavity in the left upper lobe. The three sputum samples are taken and sent to pathology laboratory for microscopic evaluation, which show mycobacterium tuberculosis. What special stain is most likely to be used for? Mycobacterium tuberculosis. To cut the story short, they have wasted your time. They want you to waste time. So, key in your assembly. So, they want you to be smart enough to read the whole thing and after reading thing, take out the meat immediately. So, answer it. Penstein is used for tuberculosis.